Farnsworth Colson, bearded man, man behind, in front of pictures, author. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the Uniweb interview show. My name is Matt Weiss. I'm your host, Lucas. I can call you Lucas. That's right. Yeah. Great. You won't kill me for that. Uh, That's true. What? <laughs> I don't know why I'm talking about murder so much today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming on the Uniweb show. I really appreciate your time. Um, you are the author of In the Shadow of Prometheus, mm-hmm. which will be coming out May 4th. That's right. May the 4th be with you. Is that why you planned that date? You know, it definitely was part of the process. The uh-huh. other thing was um, we had this illustrator who came onto the project uh, relatively late into the process. Um, it's really great. John Zumro. Highly recommend people check out his work. Um, okay. But I was originally going to release in March, um, but then you know got connected with him, and uh, it just seemed like May fourth would be the earliest that we could have all of the artwork done and sort of like integrated into the book. Um, yeah. So it just kind of was fortuitous. So is uh, is the picture that that's on your uh, profile on Twitter is the the background picture? Is that the cover for the book? It is not. It's just a promotional material, but uh, that looks really up cool. until yeah, it is. It is, <laughs> but uh, no, I I have um, like a lot of different um, like pr- promotional materials and things that I'm starting to cycle through as we're getting close to to launch yeah. and the advertisement campaign. Um, but if you go to theringsaga.com, which is the website for the book, we've got like okay. right there, big boom cover of the book right on page one. You, this is interesting. Um, in the shadow of Prometheus, how long? And I want to. I want to know all about this book. It sounds really, really cool, and it sounds like you've put a lot of thought into it, which I never put in a lot of thought into anything I do. So that's great. Um, what is the, what is the book about? First off, until we, and then we'll talk about all the other stuff. Sure, and of course, like I think probably like any author, you know, when you get posed the question like, what is the book about? There's yeah, always yeah. like kind of a little bit of a struggle. Like, do you want to go into the plot? Do you want to go into like the the world building? Like, like I know, so I know. It, it's it, it's one of those it's <laughs> one of those questions that I love to ask because I know people hate it because I hate being asked that. Because yeah. I'm always like, well, it means this to me, but for where I want it to mean this to you, and it's yeah. like this whole amoeba of things. But so so yeah. Let me let me I guess start with just like um, the plot. Let's go to the plot. Well, wait, can I back up a little bit? And, uh, <laughs> no! So <let> me, <laughs> do as I say. <laughs> let, let me start with the premise. So okay. the premise of the book is uh, it's a near-future science fantasy novel. Um, and also, like uh, literally speaking, it's a, it's a philosophical novel. Um, mm-hmm. And so what it does is it takes a look at, at the near future in the 23rd century. And essentially what's happened between now and, and then is that basically all of the politicking of the current world order or world orders like the different governments in control just completely like collapses um and huge uh like world war type situation going on and then just chaos right because there's so much you know, like insurrection from the populations against the governments that basically you just get pandemonium and then from out of the ashes of all of that um People from around the world, particularly, uh, you know, in academic and um, otherwise, like, nonprofit, uh, non-incentivized efforts, uh, come together, make a grassroots movement around this philosopher, uh, Edgar von Galen, uh, who pens this book called The Ethocracy. Um, And essentially, it's a new form of governance um, that sort of instead of putting political authority um, just sort of off of just the, like, you know, the present day sort of like narratives that you get looking at uh, intellectual authority, right? So like environmentalists probably should be the ones legislating on the environment. Uh, Doctors should be talking about healthcare, right? And like, obviously they need access to the tools and resources like uh, for economics and whatnot. But uh, essentially this is the world in which the story takes place. Um, and, uh, there is, you know, just this sort of like political, uh, side to, uh, that 
world experience, but there's also um, like this this group that is kind of a hybrid between being just uh, politicians, but also um, you know being peacekeepers um, and uh, being like social role models and leaders in, in society in different contexts. Um, and one of them, and they're called the Vanguard. Um, and their job is to, uh, like within the context of legislation, their job is to sort of ethically audit the output of um, the government and make sure that legislation isn't going to harm people, right? Just like with the hospital where you have like an ethics panel, um, yeah. just kind of like that. Um, but then they also, you know, like I said, they, they do uh, peacekeeping stuff, uh, like what the United Nations does, they do all sorts of different things. Now, Oni and Agonie, who's the protagonist, she's a vanguard. Uh -huh. um, and she ends up being thrown into a situation uh, with these terrorists called the Machiavellians, uh, who basically are trying to push for kind of like the old nation state model and go back to, to that way of, of being in the world. Um, and then in addition, uh, she is encountering this strange uh, magical, be magical being, uh, self-styled as the All-Father, who's doing just like some really weird shit. Um, and, <laughs> and so, like, you know, no, no matter where, where she's coming from, right, where it's like the future politicking or this weird, like, mystical dude that's, like, invading her dreams and stuff, uh, she just can't seem to catch a break. <laughs> um, and the story kind of looks at um, the ways in which that kind of way of existing in the world uh, with the ethocracy, uh, like what would a world like that look like? How yeah. would people react to that? What would be the, what would be the real world reactions to that? Um, and then also sort of playing into um, other kinds of narratives. I don't want to unpack too much more well, about- that's what I'm well what I'm yeah. interested in too is like it sounds like this is something that an anarchist would love, for one, that the governments all just dis are destroyed, <laughs> which is like yeah. fantastic. Did you create your own system of government through writing this book? I mean, is that what you've basically written out a whole plan to run the world? You have. <laughs> did you do that? So uh, actually, Did you mad science the crap out of this and like have a plan to take over the world now in this book. <laughs> so um, this, this did originate. Like. <laughs> yeah, this did originate with um, work that I did in grad school on my own original political theory. Um, but what I will say is that what you get handed in the Shadow of Prometheus is mm -hmm. is not. Um, it's not the same as my theory. There are, are okay. parts of it that are the same and parts of it that are very different. Um, Did you want to see if your theory would hold water in a, that kind of situation? Was it like a almost a test for what you had hypothesized as a way of governing the world? You were like, let's throw it up against this crazy idea in a book and see what happens? Yeah, I, I definitely think that was a part of it. Um, you know, I, there, the first piece of the ethocracy, right. This idea that people should actually like know what they're talking about to make decisions for tons of people. No I know it's a crazy idea, right? It's insane, right? but, <laughs> <Take it easy. laughs> um, but like given that idea and leading with that idea, um, you know, that sounds well and good, but orchestrating that for a population of billions of people, that's, um, you know, that's a much more complex problem. Um, right. And so I did kind of want to get into that um, and sort of like look at what the complexities are of like having that actually being a part of human life just generally um, and being instituted the way that humans think of these things right now, which is um, through these huge, you know, bureaucratic institutions. Um, so like that's just kind of the way that we do things now. So I, I think it's more realistic to think that like, if we ever moved in that direction, it would start looking like what is in the book. Um, but okay. that's not the same as my political theory. I don't endorse all of it. <laughs>
Yeah, you're just making stuff up, right? I mean, <laughs> it's yeah, like exactly, you're, you're, creating, right? you're like, creating an interesting story. Yeah, there's this uh, this uh, antagonist, the ravenous thane. Some of the nice. the things he does on the people he kills, you know, I don't endorse that either. Um, sure, that's yeah. It's like when people write like mystery novels or, or suspense thrillers with like serial killers. It's not like I'm saying I love serial killers <laughs> or anything. I mean, some it's, of the time. Some of the time. <laughs> yeah. After after talking to me before we started recording, you probably think now that this guy is somehow obsessed with murder. <laughs> well, maybe you're writing uh, the the murder mystery. I think I might be. I don't know. I haven't started on it. But so the uh, in, in the shadow of Prometheus, when when did you start writing this book? And um, it's now finished. The artwork is being finalized. Um, is there artwork actually in the pages of the book, or is it? Are you talking about like there are? Okay. Yeah. How long is, yeah. How long is the the novel? Uh, it's about two hundred and eighty pages, um, okay. and there are twenty three chapters with one chapter illustration to the start of each chapter. Very cool. Um, yeah, it is. It, it's uh, it's pretty exciting. We have so I started writing the book um, in, in earnest about like early fall, late summer of last year. Uh -huh. um, I had a few different like pieces you know five to ten pages here and there of ideas that ended up kind of being grafted into this narrative um yeah. but when i really got serious about it was like august of last year um and then it really picked up around christmas time was this something you had uh, outlined or was it um just kind of flying by a basic idea a premise multiple different premises that you just kind of wove together Started with the premise, and then it just sort of, like, there was just a moment where I was like, okay, I've set up all of the pins of, like, what I want to set up, and now I need to knock them down, right? right. So then there was, like, a major plotting session uh, of, like, a week where I yeah. just sort of, like, just really crammed to think about, like, what all of the possible uh, outcomes would be for this world that I've built, um, yeah. and then deciding on what I thought was the very best one. Mm. And so the main character is going, tell me it's, it's a female, and what was her name again? Oni Anagonye. Voni Anagonye. Oni, uh, Oni, like O-N-I. Oni Anagonye. Yes. Yeah. So, and she's, and she's, is it like a hero's journey type, type tale? It, it's, uh, yeah. yeah, okay. She's going to find out how the world's supposed to end. <laughs> I just made that up. I don't know. You got to tell me. Yeah, that. yeah, That's yeah. So, on. okay. So now there's the, the plot. Now the plot. Right? right? Now the plot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we catch her just before this, uh, you know, terrorist attack um, mm -hmm. that happens on Metropolis, which is like the basically rebranded Vienna in the 23rd century. Okay. Um, and so essentially uh, what happens is there's this attack um the machiavellians are they, they break into like the national archives and and get like um just a ton of like data that was like uh confidential data for the government um and then essentially the whole system just kind of goes into like this this lockdown um and she is supposed to sort of like be a part of that process of um, trying to prevent any sort of like bad fallout from all this happening. Um, but then this, this, uh, this other, on the other side of things, right, with the like sort of like mystical side, um, mm -hmm. this entity, um, the All Father, he, he is, you know, very powerfully with the conviction that um, this world order needs to end as well. Um, and is also convinced of the fact that the Machiavellians are terrible. Um, and that essentially that basically humanity is moving ever more towards uh, like a just society. Uh -huh. um, and so that this society, even though it's great, it also needs to, to fall and give way to something better, um, right? So he's on that one side, but like he's also doing awful things. Um, in order to make this, his happen. methods are questionable. Yes, yes, okay. very. Um, <laughs> very questionable. So, yeah. 
so yeah, it's there's a whole lot to unpack there, but like ultimately speaking, the the plot is sort of like looking at this Machiavellian insurgency, um, looking at, at its actions, looking at the actions of this sort of more uh, philosophical um, side of things with the All Father, um, and he his ideas like for anyone who actually likes philosophy uh, are, are basically Hegel's uh, ideas of a uh, world spirit, um, and so like when you look at what he does. Um, and you look at what the Machiavellians do and how Oni interacts with these things, it's kind of a way of looking at these different ideas about utopia and, and what utopia is and how it's supposed to look, uh, and also dystopia um, and what it is and how it's supposed to look, and just sort of like rejecting the mainstream narratives that we've had about how clear-cut these things are. Yeah, because it can be different for a lot of different people. So there's there's three main groups, it sounds like, in this that are trying to move forward in their own direction. Like you got the Machiavellians who want it the old way. Acuna, right? Uh, Onya, Acuna? Uh, Oni Anagonia. Oni Anagonia. Yeah. She's trying to move it in the direction that it's in right now, right? Yeah. Or like keep it there. And then you got the All Father who's trying to move it towards his idea of utopia. Yeah. And so they're on a collision course. Yeah. And they're going to have karate fights. That's right. It's, uh, it's actually like a really <laughs> contrived uh, pro karate lobbyist book. Wait, are you serious? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> that was like, totally was nailed totally it, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Karate, karate lobbyist. Yeah, that would be. <laughs> that would be no, it sounds like a really cool, a, a really great idea. Where was the inspiration for this? I know you said you had written part of your uh, a paper in school, um, but what was the like the the fantastical element? Where where did this all come from? Like the All Father, and where's your inspiration for writing that that style? Sure. So I. It comes a lot from my own personal life and experience um, in that I kind of find myself at a crossroads between a bunch of different ways of viewing life. Um, yeah. So just to give you like a little bit of background about um, how I came to do this, because I think it's relevant to answering your question. Sure. Um, when I was in undergrad, I mean, I, I was... I was like a fairly progressive person, but I, I was a Christian um, and was like very much in love with like C.S. Lewis. Um, yeah. And then I met the director for undergraduate studies and he was like pretty impressed, like with the stuff that I was doing in his class. Um, and so he took me on for an independent study uh, on the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. Um, and then, so I published a paper that, that's how I got into Yale, was publishing that paper. Um, and then that summer, I got gravely ill. Um, I had the worst case of pneumonia the pulmonologist of 30 years had ever seen. Um, right. So I was in the ICU for 10 days. And on the seventh day, it was still not getting better. And they had actually told my family to expect that I was going to die. Um, so <laughs> like you go through an experience like that, yeah. um, and you experience pain like that and it makes you question a lot about your life, right? Like yeah. how is, how do we live in a world where that kind of pain, you know, it's one thing to see it in other people, right. And have compassion sure. and have empathy, but to experience it like that kind of pain firsthand, yeah. um, you know, it, it opens a lot of questions and then this con't uh, study that I had done was already like from a theoretical standpoint, it was changing a lot of like how I looked at these things. Mm -hmm. um, and so <laughs> by the time I got to Yale and I was doing my philosophy program with a concentration in philosophy of religion, um, I became an atheist. Um, and uh, so in terms of like, just kind of like wheeling back to um, kind of how I decided to craft that narrative. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm this sort of like deeply spiritual, religious, atheist, non-believer. Um, 
who is very progressive, but also, like, doesn't buy into the narrative that we have actually come up with all of the viable possible solutions one way or another. Um, yeah. and, and unlike the anarchist, I, I just, I think I'm more optimistic. I think that the answers are out there. And I think yeah. that, I think society is very pessimistic about the state of affairs right now, about what's possible. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we've entered this sort of like postmodern world where, um, you know, people say like everything under the sun has been done before. Um, people are just very pessimistic about these things. Right. Sure. And I just don't, I just don't buy it. Um, yeah. And so I, I wanted to do something new. Um, yeah. And that's kind of what I what this book was. was I think the greatest the yeah. greatest answers to things in life come from uh, immense pain. I've always been told that uh, pain is the the cornerstone of spiritual growth, and uh, been through some very near death things myself. Going through pain where you you just question the the idea of like how how. If there is a loving, caring God, is would this be possible to be burdened on me or any other human being? <clears throat> and asking yourself that question over and over again, and then trying to move forward with the same idea that you had before, as a child who hadn't, you know, who has never gone through anything like that, it does fundamentally change what you believe. Um, and I think that's necessary for growth. I think that is, and I think that's something that a lot of us need to uh i get we can't force we can't force it that kind of growth yeah and it's it's a wonderful thing to seek and writing you know creating a whole a whole story and a whole universe kind of in seeking of that answer and and trying to you know progress that narrative for yourself i think is a beautiful testimony for you oh thank you yeah man it's cool because I, I think as human beings, we all go, we all suffer something. And that's one yeah, of the reasons definitely. I do this show is because we all have a story to tell that through the hardest parts of our lives that we've never really got to share with anybody else that we're able to, to share and show another human being that, Hey, it's possible to get through even a near death ammonia uh, experience where it's, you know, the worst case ever, but we made it through and it's possible to do something with your life or whatever it is, but we're able to lift one another as, as human beings through sharing that story inside of us. I For think sure. it's a powerful thing, man. Yeah. One thing that, um, that I want to note just cause I, I, I realized I didn't make it very clear. Uh, you know, I, as much as like, I, you know, I talked about like the, what the pulmonologist said and everything about it being like the worst case, but like pneumonia is one of the leading causes of death. Lots of people experience, you know, yeah, exactly what what i ended up experiencing lots of people yeah. die from it so like the thing that i was struggling with was not so much my own pain but thinking about that 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 level of pain exists and that all of us end up facing something like that eventually right yeah so like that Pretty was cool, what huh? I, that's what i was struggling <laughs> with but pretty cool but yeah <laughs> well that's the thing though we all have to we all have to go through it yeah, I think the the fairest thing about life is that it's kind of unfair to everybody, you know. Yeah. Whether, whether you're well, the well, well, the well. richest person in the entire world or the poorest man under a bridge, whatever it is, life has been unfair or unjust to each of us in its own in its own unique way. It's an interesting topic, and I think philosophy. I never I, I went to I went to college, but I didn't I didn't go for philosophy or anything like that. Um, but it's always been something that's in interested me because it's the like the study of thought and and, and increasing like or not increasing but uh, what am I trying to say? It's 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 like the study of thought and moving the the human narrative forward um, through outside thinking, through yeah. not keeping the same the same status quo. Uh, and I think dealing with suffering is something that we all have to learn cannot it doesn't have to be our it doesn't have to be humanity's pitfall but it can be humanity's saving grace in a yeah way. i mean the way in which you process those sorts of experiences will make or break a person right absolutely um, but um yeah i mean so philosophy um you know the original greek for it uh, philosophia right love of wisdom um mm -hmm. This uh, 
more generalized uh, back when you know it was more popular in terms of what the what the practice actually was um, is essentially just critical thought about the things that are important to us, um, yeah. and that's that's the heart of what I want to get at. So you're like dissecting basically the aspects of what makes the government, the what makes humanity, what makes these people, the utopia possible, all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, because well, so each of these groups think that they're reaching towards utopia, right? Right, um, and they think that genuinely. Um, yeah. Now that being said, there are all sorts of ways in which I think for any of them you can find deep flaws in their ideas about how these things should come about. Sure. Um, and ultimately, over the arc of the four book series that I'm writing, which is the, the Ring Saga, um, mm -hmm. I want to offer some insights about not what exactly that utopia might look like, but some insights about some you know, signposts that we need to look out for. Um, you know, things to to be cautious about, things uh, to be earnest about, and things to pursue. Yeah, has this been a? Um, I know we I know we we try to answer questions in a lot of our writing. Have you have you learned a lot through this process of of writing the book? And are you are you working on book two already, or is it? Um, have you have you uh, simply been focusing on book one? So uh, to answer your, your first question, um, I definitely have learned a lot about the writing experience, um, especially when it comes to uh, plotting. Um, yeah. You know, I, I knew, I, I already enjoyed, you know, creative writing, writing with an aesthetic focus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that was something that I really enjoyed writing when I was at Yale. Um, but the like the dialogue dialogue was a big thing for me. Plotting was a big thing for me. Uh, it's like I learned a lot about how those things get done. Um, yeah. And then to answer your second question about the the sequel, I have begun work on it. Um, okay. We're about ten percent through the first draft, so it's still got a ways to go. Um, sure. But I wrote this last book in, you know about seven eight months um yeah. so i think this one will probably go faster yeah um there's a lot of research since... that goes into it right yeah well <laughs> i see I, i'm kind of fortunate in that a lot of the research i did during my six years of schooling right so like sure. that helps but, been... <laughs> yeah so that part's already been done fortunately the other part is traveling right. which i need to do more of um but Having getting new experiences was absolutely the most important process of taking this book and putting it from a slow going affair to something that like really just kind of rocketed through. Like that trip in in Europe I was telling you about before the call, um, that was that was huge for me because it it really changed my perspective on what the world is like um, and how my lived experience is just very very different from people, you know, even from a culture as, as similar as, you know, Central Europe. Um, very different. Yeah, so we, it's, it's nice when we start growing up and start traveling a little bit, we start to realize how um, limited our knowledge really is. Yeah. And it's even more fun to realize that we'll never know everything. <laughs> yeah, for and sure. We literally just get to spend our entire lifetime experiencing new things if... I can put my ego aside and say, I don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> there's uh, there's a, a critical moment, I think, that happens in everyone's intellectual maturity at a certain point where it's like, I don't know what the truth is, but I know that's not the right answer. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> like, right. That's, that's, you know, it's one thing to say, I have the right answer. I've got it all figured out. It's another thing to say, hey, wait a moment, these are really complicated questions, and maybe we should pause and not be so hasty to assume that we already know 
what to make of a situation, right? Right, because we live in a three-dimensional world and we try to look at things two-dimensionally and it's like, no, you got to you got to go all the way around. <laughs> and yeah. then yeah. And then sometimes inward, outward, you got to do it all. Good luck trying to do it in a lifetime. And then you get into the fourth dimension of it and it's like, bro, <laughs> like open your mind, man. There's so much out there, which is really great. And I, I would love to talk to you more about it, but I do want to know um, about your marketing efforts. You said you have a plan in place for uh, for getting your book out. You are are you self publishing this on Amazon? I, KDP? I, I am. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Basically, uh, everything that I heard from agents was, "Wow, really love the story." It's never going to to be something that people will take for a debut novel because it's so weird and so different, right? <laughs> like they're like, "I personally love it, but I don't know how to sell it to a publisher." Um, mm. And uh, like at a certain point, I was just like, "All right, well." If if everyone is saying that they love it, but they don't know that they can sell it to a publisher, at a certain point, don't you think that means that maybe this is just like an untapped thing, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. So that, yeah, so that's kind of what my perspective was. I knew I could edit it at a professional level for myself because um, of my background. And so I just said, yeah, I'm going to independently publish and we'll see where this goes. Um, and yeah, I, I also got the help of a professional marketer uh her name is eliza van court um she, she's like an affiliate with cornell university um and just sort of like uh love the project and so she just said yeah I'll, I'll help you out pro bono um gave basically just coached me on on how to do that marketing side of things yeah well that's i feel like the biggest struggle for most authors is we're all creative tuned but then when it comes to showing off our work we're all like ah, don't look at me like we just yeah. stepped out of the shower you know and uh yeah sure it can be a scary scary endeavor what are some i i uh, tips that she's given you to attack this monster of marketing well so the first and most important thing is uh as, as far as she was able to to teach me in the limited time we had together was um Using the the Amazon algorithm um, yeah. to, to your benefit, right? So, like, there's a lot of information out there about how you should get your your base people, right? Your base supporters. Um, mm -hmm. So, sort of, like, the, the biggest thing is getting your base supporters all to buy within a, a short window, uh, within a few hours of a day, yeah. um, actually is ideal. And then the, the, other, the other thing... Um, is setting your categories correctly um, on, on the Amazon market because essentially you need to be able to realistically identify um, how many books you can sell with your base support um, and then identify if that gets you like on what part of the bestsellers list for that category. So, yeah. for example, uh, Oni is... Um, a, you know, a gay woman of color, right? So yeah. part of that... I did not know that, by the way. Oh. <laughs> uh, all right. So, yeah. She's so like, you know. <laughs> nope. <laughs> my bad. Um, That's okay. Yeah, so, she, so she's a gay woman of color. Um, and this was important to me because, you know, for, well, first of all, I'm, I'm also LGBT, but also, second of all, um, I wanted to show a world that sort of like has really tried to struggle and, and like process through this idea that human dignity is inherent. Right. right. Um, and so like she um, is an example of this, right. She's one of the most powerful people in the world. Um, mm -hmm. And she navigates personal bias while also having that role. Right. right. Um, and so like, that's a big thing for her. Um, but, but so to get back to the marketing piece of this, um, because of the fact that this is an LGBT story, um, I'm going to be using the science fiction, uh, LGBT category. Um, right. and we've crunched the numbers. We are going to hit number one bestseller in that category. Um, so that's a, a relatively niche category. Um, not a lot did of books. You just, did you just call your shot, bro? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
half court face backwards. Nice, man. That's freaking awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's exciting. Um, I wish I could do math. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it was a philosophy degree. Don't don't assume that I can do math, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should have seen my GRE scores. It's like reading, writing, boom, great, great. Yeah, math, not so good. <laughs> not that's so good. So calculators are for man. Um, that's amazing though that you've you figured out that you guys are gonna be number one through through the marketing um, efforts and and using the algorithms. Are you? Do you have like a a set of readers already set up like arc readers that are going to get advanced copies and have uh, reviews out as soon as the book yeah. hits yeah you you, you got to do that with um your base supporters and you have to recognize that that's going to be like the most uh that's going to be like the big gamble right it's like yeah. you, you need to be able to like reach out to your connections make them want the, a copy of your book right yeah. Uh, and then say, okay, I'm going to give you an advanced copy. And then you read it. Then when the book comes out, buy a copy and review on Amazon, right? right. Um, and, it, and it has to be on the same day. Yep. Um, and then once that happens, your book will go through, as long as you're listed as a bestseller in a category, um, it'll go bump right up to the top of the list so that everyone who cares about that category will see it listed. Mm. Wow. That's important information that I think, I, I think we get so uh, confused when people are like, it's the algorithm, man. Everyone's like, what the <laughs> fuck is an algorithm, man? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I don't no, know what that right. means. Yeah. But it's basically having as many people buy and process some information on your book the day it comes out yeah yeah so that it's recognized by amazon is oh people want this product let's show more people this category and see if they want to buy it too yeah because amazon course, wants to make money yeah they do want to make so <laughs> that's, <do> make- <laughs> that's the basic <laughs> gist of it yeah and of course, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? Because like you don't want to reach out to everyone you know um, unless you have something that is like a, a finished, polished project that you're like, I'm sure you'll love it if you'll just pick it up, right? right. And like that that gets to be like, uh, I think if you don't have a network sort of like established, it can be kind of socially uncomfortable. Um, Absolutely. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I found the hardest group of people to sell in my life have been my family and friends. The people I oh, don't yeah. know who just got to know me are like, this guy's great. <laughs> Let's check out his <laughs> book. My family's like, you wrote a book? <laughs> Get out of here, man. Yeah, I feel man. like, honestly, it would have been easier for me to walk up to every single one of my family members and friends and be like, can I borrow $4? And they'd be like, yeah, here, leave me alone. That, as opposed to me being like, will you buy this novel that i wrote spent time working on for four bucks they're like i'm not reading your nonsense <laughs> yeah because because it's it's uh it's bias right like they know yeah. you at your best and at your worst right yeah and so Most when they the worst. <laughs> <laughs> so when they see that you have a book that's written they're just being brought back immediately to that most like that most awkward thing that they remember from you, right? And it, yeah. so it gets hard to, to take seriously. Like, I think. This is the same guy that pooped in the street. I'm not buying it, this book. <laughs> ex- ex- exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, my uh, that seven times. Okay. <laughs> a week. <laughs> <laughs> it's where my bathroom is, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you Can't go in the apartment. Yeah, man. It's just this room. <laughs> <laughs> no that's that's awesome uh fantastic information for anybody out there who's who's working on self-publishing so have you how have you built your network up i mean you seem like a pretty you know like you've built a good reputation over your life you've obviously you went to yale which you have to have some sort of good record <laughs> to get into yale there's got to be some prestige there um what have you found work for you social media wise or just in your local community sure um so 
you know, just a lot of relationships that I built in my college years and grad school years, um, just sort of like building out the base support. And you never know how those things are going to play out, right? Like, right. Um, one of my friends, you know, he's got a large family uh, out in the Midwest, and he's going to buy eight copies on lunch day because he's got a big family. And yeah, exactly, right? So, like, you just... Yeah, I just built like a lot of relationships with people who were similarly minded with these things. Um, hey, pro and, tip, real quick: your sure. acknowledgement page. If your it's acknowledgement like page four, is extensive, four. yeah, and has a lot of names that are people that are going to buy your book, Amazon will take that, and they will like wipe out those reviews. They won't let them leave a review. So whoa, yeah. Oh. Yeah, if if this if because if the information in the book matches up with somebody's information from Amazon, they're like, nope. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. Um, yeah. I will that's just that and that and that's something I've seen from uh, people I've talked to that it's it's like if if they have any matching qualifications, then it's they'll just for whatever reason they won't they won't post the review. I mean, they'll let them buy it, obviously, but they won't post it. Wow. All right. Well, good to know. Um, and I will keep it. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, I've got like a four-page acknowledgement. So. <laughs> Just use initials, bro. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> kind of changes things, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't... I, it's, it's funny the way they do that, because like, even my mom wasn't able to leave a, rev a review for me. Like my girlfriend wasn't able to leave, leave a review for me, um, but it's something I guess I don't know if it, they don't list that anywhere. I, it's probably in their policy somewhere, but who knows? Who reads those things really? <laughs> I mean, for God's sakes, it's so you've I, I will totally off track. I know I know I threw you off with that one. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I let you know though, just in case. Um, have you so you just recently got on Twitter though? Yeah, that's right. Was uh was Twitter and Facebook is Facebook also new to you getting on Facebook marketing wise? Yeah, uh, I did a ton of research on how to do advertisements for Facebook to make them as effective as possible. Um, but you know, at, at this point, like Twitter has been a much more successful platform for me. And yeah. my understanding in general is that that's just true for, for most artists, that like unless you're paying Facebook for the, the ads, um, it's really hard to gain traction uh, on, on yeah. Facebook beyond like connections. Um, just, be, just because of the fact that they, they changed how much they let pages enter people's news feeds. Um, yeah. And so it's, it's really hard, even when you do have followers, they probably don't see half the things you post. Um, with Twitter, I think people tend to, you know, it's more about like the, the digestibility of information, right? So like I've got certain people that I know I want to check on on Twitter because I'm interested in their projects and what they're doing. Um, yeah. And yeah, so it just like, I, I think Twitter has been a better platform for me uh, in terms of getting support um but facebook is probably where i'm going to do most of my ad work because i also don't like the way that i mean when i see an ad on twitter uh, i just like immediately check out i'm just like nope i'm done um, i agree but they're, weirdly, they're so not, not they're so facebook. few and far between i feel like yeah the ads on twitter like i don't even recognize them as ads and anyway, i just keep scrolling yeah with Facebook, like, I still check out, like, 80, 90% of the time. But, like, when I see an ad for, you know, I'm a gamer, right? So, like, when I see an ad for oh, yeah. a video game and it looks interesting, uh, you know, I'll click on it. Sure. Yeah. Um, but, like, yeah. So, I, I, I think Twitter has been better for getting supporters just through grassroots efforts. Um, but Facebook probably is going to be where I do most of my advertising beyond Kindle. Yeah. Well, that's cool, man. A lot of good information. I'm I'm excited. I'm excited for the book. Um, In the Shadow of Prometheus comes out May fourth. L. Farnsworth, Lucas. Do you have any uh, last words for the people out there 
watching this that you want them to know that about you, about your book, about life, about philosophy, sure. something that will change their life forever. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm not. Yeah, sure. Um, so like, I definitely don't want to to sugarcoat what I've done with the book. Uh, and so like, I want people watching this to know, like, if you're looking for something to just sort of like chill out, relax, and and not have to engage very much. Like, this is probably not the book for you. Um, but if you're, like, kind of soul-searching and you're like, I, I need something, like, a different perspective, a new perspective, something uh, to chew on that I just, like, I haven't thought of before or thought through before, um, if that's where you're at, then this is definitely the book for you. Um, so that's kind of, like, the the big takeaway, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank You're you for having me on the show. Expanding your perspective, absolutely, man. It's, it was my pleasure. It's, it's a great time talking to you. Um, you're much smarter than you look. I didn't. <laughs> I'm just no, no, no. You're fantastic, dude. It was. It really was a pleasure talking to you. Um, I'm excited for the book. I'm, I want to check it out. I love expanding my mind uh, because it needs it. Honestly, <laughs> it constantly needs it, and anything that'll fuel that is is a wonderful, wonderful thing. So. I hope all the all the best success to you in this Thank process. You. And um, well, I'm terrible at ending things, so I'll see you later. <laughs>